So let me jump right into the introduction. I'll go a little bit quicker just because we've got a late start, and then we'll turn it over to Lionel Corvette to uh, uh, take us off at that point. So The Sacred Cauldron, this is both a, a book. In fact, here is the book right here. And you see the image on the screen as well, and a seminar that Lionel is going to do you know, for us today. My name is Steve Buser. I'm one of the, the hosts here with the Asheville Young Center. Uh, Len Cruz may be popping in and out. Also, Christina Becker is going to be uh, potentially on the phone if there's some discussion time later on as well. We have a number of countries joining us today. They include Canada, France, Hong Kong, Japan, Mexico, Switzerland, and the United States. It will be about 90 minutes. You'll be able to ask questions either via email at the address listed above, or you can type in questions into the chat feature. That's the easier way to do it. And if you play with the software a little bit, you'll see that feature. Uh, you probably figured this out by now if you can hear my voice. But if you can't hear my voice, you won't know I'm saying this. But you need to choose microphone and speakers to listen to the audio through the computer. Uh, or you can also call by telephone, and there is instructions if you click on the telephone button with that. But usually the microphone and speakers are the easier way to do it. Do check out some of the features of the software. There's a button called full screen mode. You can enlarge the presenter video. Um, there won't be slides other than my slides right now, so make sure to maximize the video once I'm done with this. You can see Lionel Corbett yeah, more easily. Yeah, a couple things. Uh, I'll just fly through these briefly so we can get on to Dr. Corbett. But we'll be continuing with our alchemy course. We did a brief introduction you know, back last year. Now we're going to do a five-month uh, seminar series on alchemy. That will be out of Zurich with Dr. Marie Stein. So far, has gone really well with the intro. We're looking forward to the full course about to start. And you can see the intro in the archived recorded version if you'd like to see that beforehand. We have a couple other seminars coming up, January 18th, just around the corner in Chicago, and you'll be getting more information by email about this. And another one from San Francisco as well, towards the end of January, on death as a capstone of individuation. And again, you'll be getting more information about these in our email packages as well. Uh, we're still having red book prints available. I'll not spend any time on this, but you can go to our website and you can actually order prints from the red book that are museum quality, pretty amazing prints. For our CEU participants, I'm required to announce that we have no commercial support for presenters, topics, or programs. There's no pharmaceutical industry support of any kind associated today. Uh, we are recording today so that uh, if you uh, type in a question that might be able to end up on the uh, recorded version, if you decide to open your microphone, if there's time later for discussions, that could be recorded as well. So just know that anything you do, uh, not anything, if you open up your video camera or your microphone, that might be recorded. So on to introduce you know, Lionel. He is trained in medicine and psychiatry from England. He's a full Jungian analyst from the C.G. Young Institute of Chicago. He's a core faculty member at Pacifica and author of numerous books, including Psyche and the Sacred, The Religious Function of the Psyche, and The Sacred Cauldron, Psychotherapy as a Spiritual Practice. And of course, that's the seminar that we'll be looking at today. I won't read through this, but this is on our website and tells you a little bit more about the book as well. So without further ado, uh, we will turn it over uh, to uh, Dr. Corbett. Well, good evening. Uh I'm going to talk this evening about the problem of suffering and some of Jung's approaches to suffering, because I think this really is the central issue in psychotherapy, and it's certainly one of the main reasons that people come for psychotherapy. Um, there are two approaches of Jung that I want to focus on, and I'll try and show how they're related to each other. One is the idea that the discovery of meaning in suffering may make suffering meaningful or tolerable or bearable. This is an idea that's been stressed, by, of course, by many other people besides Jung, like Viktor Frankl. The other is Jung's idea that uh, contact with the numinous, the numinous experience, has a healing effect. Um, and so I'll give some examples of the way in which I found that numinous experience can be helpful. And of course, the connection between these two ideas is that numinous experiences are always intensely meaningful, almost by definition. And uh, they are uh, an important source of meaning when, when we're suffering. Um, 
Now, when suffering begins, we find ourselves at the threshold of a new status in life very often, and the outcome may be very uncertain. And for many people, questions of meaning and purpose come to the fore, and they're certainly raised in psychotherapy occasionally. People ask questions like, why is this happening to me? Or, Have I done something to deserve this? That kind of thing. And it's not unusual for intense suffering to call into questions our, our really uh, our fundamental assumptions about reality. Many of us have an underlying belief that the world is a good place, that people are benevolent, that the world is meaningful, that we tend to get what we deserve and so on. And then when we suffer unexpectedly and intensively, um, these kinds of beliefs are called into question and we may have to radically reevaluate our sense of meaning in life. In general, by meaning, I mean the sense that life has a purpose, that life has value, um, that uh, very often meaning means the sense that we're connected to something larger than ourselves, perhaps a, a spiritual tradition, uh, or to um, something like preserving the environment, working for social justice, helping others, those kinds of things. In other words, it's important to add here that one's life can be meaningful, but not necessarily happy. Now, in the context of suffering, the word meaning can have other connotations. Um, meaning might indicate the emotional importance of the suffering, what the po problem is pointing to, its implications for the future. Sometimes the implications for the future of a problem that we have are more important than the immediate problem. Sometimes we can discover meaning because the, the suffering seems to have an apparent purpose for the telos, the, the purpose, the, the future development of the personality. One might be able to find meaning simply when one is suffering by being able to find some enjoyable activities and some important relationships, despite the fact that one is suffering. It also can, meaning can also mean that we can see a pattern, we can make connection between disparate elements in our life that otherwise would seem unconnected. Sometimes we can see a, a connection between our current situation and developmental factors um, and uh, the way the whole situation is pointing us towards the future. Finding meaning may not only mean that we make sense of the situation, but even sometimes that we have an idea of why the situation must be the way it is. We have a kind of intuition of this. Now, Jung makes a great deal about this issue of the need to feel to find meaning in suffering. He always wants us to explore what suffering wants to tell us. For Jung, a symptom always has a purpose. Without the suffering produced by an emotional difficulty, anxiety or depression or whatever, he believes that we wouldn't discover something important about ourselves. Here's a quote from uh, Volume 10, page 167. Hidden in the neurosis is a bit of still undeveloped personality, a precious fragment of the psyche. And then uh, the same place, page 170. We shouldn't try and get rid of a neurosis, but rather to experience what it means, what it has to teach, what its purpose is. We don't cure it. It cures us. Sounds like a little bit of an overstatement, but what he means there is that there's some split off aspect of the personality that needs to be integrated that the suffering is pointing to. So the, the, the symptom, the suffering, is not so much an enemy as a signal. It's, it's perhaps the first step in a, in a healing process. He's trying to get past the ego's limited frame of reference so that we can see things in a larger perspective. He believes essentially that symptoms like anxiety or depression are messages from the self, the transpersonal self, or from the unconscious, messages that something needs attention. And if we take that view, then we can trust our suffering. Otherwise, symptoms are nothing more than something we need to get rid of. And that, of course, points to a major problem with the forms of psychotherapy like cognitive behavioral therapy, which only tries to remove symptoms. It eliminates, this approach would eliminate what the psyche is trying to tell us. It would be rather like trying to treat a fever as if it was the disease itself. Jung is telling us that simply to try and get rid of symptoms would ignore the larger dimensions of the psyche, the transpersonal dimension of the psyche. Um, elsewhere, he writes that emotional suffering cannot be reduced to childhood difficulties alone. This is a quote from uh, 
volume five, page 100. For we know today that everyone has them, these childhood difficulties. We ask rather, what is the task which the patient does not want to fulfill? What difficulty is he trying to avoid? In other words, another cause of suffering is that we're not dealing well with an important life task, with the next step that we have to take developmentally. Now, um, he points out that some of the people who consulted him, this is a quote from Collected Works 11, page 121-22, some of the people who, who consulted him, quote, have no clinically recognizable neurosis. They have difficulties which involve fundamental questions of existence. They suffer because of religious difficulties or ethical or philosophical beliefs and so on. So, quote, psychotherapy has to spread into regions that were formerly the province of priests and philosophers. He says actually about a third of the people who came to see him were suffering from, quote, the senselessness and aimlessness of their lives. That's on page 41, volume 11. The soul suffers when it stagnates spiritually, and the psychotherapist has to find the meaning that quickens, page 331. He goes on to say, meaninglessness inhibits the fullness of life and is therefore equivalent to illness. Meaning makes a great many things endurable, perhaps everything. That's on page 340. Now, for some authors, like Agnella Yaffe, um, Jung's stress on meaning has been elevated to a kind of mythic level. As if humanity's metaphysical task uh, is the continuous expansion of consciousness, and that process will make life meaningful. So for in individuals who've lost all sense of meaningless, it's important in his words that what the doctor then does is less a question of treatment than of developing the creative possibilities latent in the patient himself. That's uh, volume 11, page 41. Now in a letter, uh, this is in the volume of letters, volume one, page 236, and then 247. He's clear that suffering is an intrinsic part of human life, and without it, we would never do anything. He thinks that happiness and suffering are a pair of opposites that are indispensable for life, and we couldn't have one without the other. We have to be able to endure suffering, and endurance is, is a way of overcoming it. And the principal aim of psychotherapy is, quote, to help the patient acquire steadfastness and philosophic patience in the face of suffering. Life demands for its completion and fulfillment a balance between joy and sorrow. That's volume 16, page 81. For him, the process of individuation, um, becoming the person you were destined to become, invariably involves suffering, and it requires a series of initiatory experiences and ordeals. Um, in this context, it's important to note that Jung's theory of individuation is actually a process by which the, the spiritual potentials of the self incarnate into a personal self. Um, so that's what's meant by the notion that the, the self is the archetypal basis of the ego, meaning that the self acts as a kind of blueprint for the developing personality. It's the archetypal basis of the empirical personality. And these spiritual potentials gradually embody themselves over the course of one's life as we become more and more conscious of them. Part of Jung's metaphysics includes the idea that this incarnation of the self into an empirical personality is continuous. It's occurring in everyone all the time. And it means that the unconscious or the self is gradually becoming more and more embodied within the, within the individual, which for some people, for some authors, is a psychological way of saying that the divine itself becomes more and more conscious within the individual. And this uh, incarnation invariably involves suffering. So, for example, one way this incarnation occurs is through the distress caused by a complex, because the affect, the emotion attached to a complex, is felt in the body. So, the, the emotional tone of the complex produces painful uh, somatic autonomic arousal inside the body. And of course, the complex has an archetypal core, a spiritual core. So the incarnation of the self 
or the incarnation of the archetype can occur by means of the affective component of the complex because affect is felt in the body. Jung also makes a, a point about the difference between neurotic suffering, which is due to repression and conscious suffering. So for example, a hysterical conversion disorder in which severe emotional pain is converted into a physical symptom, which causes suffering, for him is a way of avoiding a deeper level of more authentic suffering, which the physical symptom is masking. So he says, neurotic suffering conceals, quote, a level of natural and necessary suffering, which the patient has been unwilling to bear. That's volume 16, page 81. Therefore, to remain at the level of removing symptom, symptoms would deprive the person of the opportunity of developing some unreal, unrealized aspect of the personality. Now, um, another important aspect of suffering is to see it as an entrance into liminality, in, uh, as an initiation into a new level of consciousness. You remember that liminality is the term used by anthropologists when they're describing rites of passage in tribal cultures. It's the betwixt and between stage, when one is not fully out of the old status and not fully in the new status in life. And these periods of transition, these liminal periods, are often periods of emotional breakdown. And sometimes it helps to cope with suffering if we see it as an archetypal process of transition. Uh, the, the, the process of uh, liminality is an initiatory transitional process. It's a spiritual process with an intelligence and a telos behind it. It's not simply the result of random misfortune. You could think of it as the dark night of the soul. Now, this attitude to suffering, seeing it as an initiation, as a part of liminality and so on, could be part of the therapist's personal myth. It's not necessarily the kind of thing that has to be discussed with the patient. But there are some people who are sophisticated enough to find it helpful. The idea is simply that the person is being initiated into a new level of awareness. It's not meaningless pain. Another important archetypal dimension is that prolonged suffering might be an initiation into the role of a wounded healer. The difficulty with that idea is that one is only usually able to see that retrospectively, not while the suffering is happening, because one doesn't know what's going to happen during the liminal period. Very often suffering will make us realize that life has become too dry, or that we've been living a life that's not right for us, that's not an authentic expression of who we are, a life that has no particular meaning. Now this is a state of mind that can come up upon relatively healthy people, when they're depressed or when they're having some kind of life crisis, then it's often temporary. But the question of meaning cannot be taken for granted, even for pretty healthy people. There's a great deal of collective uncertainty today about whether life is meaningful. Especially this is true for people for whom traditional religion has lost its power. And there are large numbers of people in that position so that we are going through a cultural transition in that respect. Traditional religions used to provide all the answers that we needed to make life meaningful, but this is no longer the case for lots of people. We then have to search for meaning individually, and this can produce tremendous turmoil and crisis. And for some people, it's a terrifying prospect to do this, and they tend to become fundamentalists. That allows them to clutch, to cling to a set of preformed answers to life's difficulties. But unless you're a fundamentalist, the, the search for meaning can be quite a difficult night's sea journey. And for many people, it becomes a central component of psychotherapy. There is a debate in the literature here about whether the search for meaning is a healthy process or not. There are some people who take the position that if you're looking for meaning, by definition, you must be depressed because otherwise life is automatically meaningful, or at least you're having a crisis of faith. Um, the search for meaning has been positively related to openness as a personality trait and negatively related to dogmatism. Dogmatic people tend not to be searching for meaning because they've already found it. When one does find meaning, one 
develops a sense of coherence, a sense of order in what might otherwise feel like a chaotic or random situation of suffering. Uh, a difficult life event like a sudden major illness can be very disruptive and it can threaten one's sense that life is worth living. And then the, the search for meaning can become very important and it's also, if we find some meaning in it, it's very helpful in adaptation. This is so important that the question of meaning um, has become a major factor in the study of people with major illnesses, cancer, depression, autoimmune diseases, and these kind of problems, and even some social pathologies have been referred to as diseases of meaning. Um, because the discovery of meaning allows suffering people to continue to care about living. But I should point out that the search for meaning, the search for significance, may be unsuccessful. There are times when uh, one has an experience like the death of a loved one, a spouse or a child and so on, and one can never make sense of it, one can never find meaning. This is very important because when the search for meaning is unsuccessful, there are very unpleasant consequences sometimes which follow, such as alcohol abuse or suicidality. And what we tend to find is that the actual answer that we find is less important than whether some answer is found. Suffering can radically change our priorities. It can make us question our belief system. Our belief system, uh, by that I mean the lens through which we look at life. It can make us lose our innocence, lose any fantasies we had of invulnerability. It can make us feel quite vulnerable, quite afraid. It is an initiation into a new state of being, and it can shake old values and beliefs. And the goals that we've been pursuing in life so far might be called into question, and these goals are important. They give us a sense that life has a purpose. Life goals are closely tied to values, and they're very important in the discovery of meaning and a sense of direction in life. Sometimes self-esteem is radically affected by the degree to which we achieve goals. States of prolonged meaningless are very demoralizing, and serious demoralization seems to adversely affect disease processes. If you have a prolonged negative affective state, despair, helplessness, resentment, those kind of things, chronic rage, these of mind and to activate the recurrence of illness, illness like heart disease and cancer, and they adversely affect the prognosis in people with these illnesses. But if you can develop states of mind, of states of hope, purpose, gratitude, joy, those more positive emotions, that seems to protect against the recurrence of many illnesses. Cancer patients who, who have high levels of meaning in their lives can tolerate much more severe physical symptoms than people who have uh, much less um, uh, a level of meaning. Um, and it's also important to note that uh, serious illnesses like cancer will often stimulate positive psychological changes and an improved sense of meaning in life. So the discovery of meaning increases life satisfaction, reduces dysphoric affect, improves general health. This seems to be that the search for meaning seems to be a fundamental human need, the need to make sense of life. And that need might be heightened when we suffer. Um, now, uh, it's also important to note that the meaning we, dis we discover might be positive or negative. It's possible to discover negative meaning in suffering. I would say then that a positive meaning is something that fosters well-being, while a negative meaning um, is, it produces a state of mind which is rather threatening. Positively, um, you might be able to affirm the value of your life, discover a goal, a sense of what's important, the sense that life is coherent. Negatively, if you discover um, meaning such as bitterness, cynicism about life, inability to trust people, um, uh, that leads to a feeling of powerlessness, uh, dysphoric affects like hopelessness, and that all seems to predispose to illness. Um, 
Another very important um, source of meaning is that one's own suffering might allow one to be helpful to others with similar difficulties. We see this a great deal in people who are recovering from addictions of various kinds, who find that they become very helpful addiction counselors. It's as if one's own suffering creates a kind of internal space in which one can contain the suffering of other people. Now, I want to talk about meaning in, Newman, in the context of numinous experience. You'll remember that in his 1937 Terry Lectures, Jung talks about religion as the careful observation of numinous experience. And very briefly, he's borrowing this term from Rudolf Otto from his 1917 book, Das Heilige, translated into English as the idea of the holy, which talks about the distinctive features of religious experience, which Otto describes as the mysterium tremendum et, fascinate, et fascinans, feel, um, a mystery which is tremendous and fascinating, feelings of fear, awe, dread, uncanny uh, experiences, horror, faced with something overpowering. Uh, classic biblical examples would be um, Saul on the road to Damascus in Acts 9, where he um, hears the voice of Jesus saying, why do you persecute me? He's uh, blinded by the light and thrown off his horse for three days. Moses at the burning bush, hearing God's voice telling him, take off your shoes, this is holy ground. Go down, tell people to, uh, tell Pharaoh to free the people and so on. So in the face of these kind of overpowering numinous experiences, one feels what Otto called, uh, described as the creature feeling. One feels very small, uh, we're in obviously faced with something other than our everyday reality. And these experiences offer beauty, salvation, love that we yearn for. We can't understand the experience. We are amazed by it, struck dumb by it. It's completely beyond our comprehension. Now, Jung um, will often refer to these kinds of experiences um, and their emotional power as very important in, during the psychotherapeutic uh, process. The important point that he makes is that these experiences happen to normal people. They're not hysterical, they're not psychotic, they're not the result of an overheated imagination. They are the result of contact with transpersonal levels in the psyche. And they are always intensely meaningful. There are some important points, in which, uh, some important areas in which Jung and Otto would differ. Um, for example, for Otto, numinous experiences always imply the Judeo-Christian God image. Otto was a Lutheran theologian. Whereas for Jung, the self can always uh, manifest itself in a much larger variety of ways than Christian theologians would allow. The God image in Jung is much less specific, much, much less specific than it is in, in the Western monotheistic traditions. So for Jung, it may appear in completely novel ways. What matters is the emotional quality of the experience. Another difference is that for Otto, one's response to the numinous should be submission, which is characteristic of many uh, mystics. Well, Jung was concerned that the ego should maintain some distance between consciousness and the unconscious. One has to remain connected to the unconscious as part of the individuation process. But the, he doesn't like the idea that the ego should be totally annihilated by the self. There are a few other differences between Jung and Otto that I won't go into in any more detail. Um, I just want to make the point that there are a large variety of ways in which numinous experiences may appear. We're very familiar with them appearing in dreams. The Jungian literature is replete with numinous dreams. Also visions and synchronistic events are important, but the numinous can appear in the natural world, through the body, and also through our pathologies as well. So quickly, an example of a dream. Uh, I've picked a dream of Anne, that Al, Anne Ulanoff has published. In this dream, a quote, a man is ardently, sincerely, deeply engaged in an act of worship, but the worship was of a giant pig. So as the saying goes, we cannot Christianize the unconscious. The numinosa may manifest itself um, in the form of any mythological or religious tradition, not necessarily the one in which the dreamer was raised. <clears throat> 
And so the self can appear in completely novel ways that may, may conflict with the imagery of the subject's religious tradition. We cannot Christianize the unconscious. So a scientist with a traditional masculine image of God had a dream in which an enormous luminous female figure is sitting on top of him. And he says, as she did so, quote, we merged and it felt as though she was entering each and every one of my body's cells. There was only a splinter of a personal self remaining. And that gave him a sense of scale. He said it was as if I was no bigger than a tiny spider. This was, that was the word he used, which is interesting. This was a humbling and transforming experience for him. Now, you could reduce this experience in terms of an overwhelming mother problem or some similar interpretation of the dreamer's personal life. And if that was correct, you could also point out that this was a very numinous experience of the feminine aspects of the divine or the self in its feminine aspects or the goddess and so on. And that has very important implications for this individual's spiritual development. His God image has been much too one-sidedly masculine. And this experience would, would show him the limitations of his traditional God image. So it's very important for his individuation process. Jung, in a letter, a 1973 letter, a 1945 letter, sorry, the letters are published in 1973, in a 1945 letter says that whatever form they take, numinous experiences may have an, a healing effect. He says, in fact, the approach to the numinous is the real therapy. So, for example, a woman whose mother is very devaluing and withholding and critical of her, critical of the body, critical of everything feminine, had the following dream. I'm in a glass elevator. There are no visible cables, but it's heading up straight into the sky, into a vast open space. I can see for hundreds of miles. I'm pressed up against a group of beautiful otherworldly women who are swaying and singing a mesmerizing melody. We are naked. I'm lifted up by them. They hold me, stroke me, and embrace me. Their song is one of love, compassion, and forgiveness. There's a feeling of intimacy. At one point, they begin dripping honey all over me. It feels loving and sweet. I'm filled with incredible peace and joy beyond words or description. Obviously, this meets Otto's criteria. It's a very numinous dream. It's mysterious, tremendous, fascinating, awesome, and so on. And it directly addresses her emotional difficulties, her devaluing of the body, her, uh, uh, her, the lack of the valuing of the feminine, and so on. And it had a very healing effect. But the imagery has absolutely no real connection to the Judeo-Christian tradition. But these numinous experiences are affectively powerful. This is, that's why they're helpful. So in Jung's words, the thing that cures a neurosis must be as convincing as the neurosis. And since the latter is only too real, the helpful experience must be equally real. Um, I mentioned the, uh, uh, the new myth. And by the way, one has no need to amplify a dream like that. Of course, the dream could be amplified in terms of honey, uh, which was sacred to the goddess, which was used in initiation ceremonies and so on. But there really is not much need to amplify that kind of very powerful numinous dream because its emotional effect is so intense. Um, I mentioned the numinous in relation to psychopathology, and here I was reminded of the book of Job because there the, the divine appears to Job out of a whirlwind or a storm. And this is particularly important because Job's children are killed when the house that they're in is blown down by a storm. So here is the very manifestation of the divine which caused his, helped to cause his intense suffering appearing to him directly in a numinous vision. It's a good illustration of the way in which one's suffering can itself be, become a form of contact with the numinous. And of course, it initiates him into a period of liminality in which he's initiated into an entirely new God image. Um, visionary experiences are rarely reported, but I don't think they're particularly uncommon. They're rarely reported because people are afraid that if they talk about having had a vision, they'll be thought to be psychotic. 
to try to get through that barrier a little bit, I'd like to describe a numinous vision of my own, which was intensely meaningful to me and helpful, but not at first. This happened uh, over five years ago. In the middle of the night, I was lying in bed. I knew I was wide awake because um, I had actually just been to the bathroom and just gotten back in bed, so I was quite sure I was awake. Suddenly, I was aware of a tall, stone gray figure standing by my bed, uh, which was quite terrifying. And the figure looked down at me. And what was even more terrifying was that the figure had three faces. It had a face that was looking straight down and a face coming out of each side of its head, facing in either direction. So three faces, a, a so-called tricephalic figure. Um, very frightening, and I had uh, great difficulty understanding it at the time, because there are many tricephalic uh, gods and goddesses in world mythology, gods with either, gods and goddesses with either three heads or three faces. Um, Kanunos in Celtic mythology, Herm, Hermes Trismegistus, uh, the Buddha, um, uh, Hecate occasionally. Those, there are several figures. I wasn't sure who this was. But finally, because of some other dreams and because of its Herm-like quality, um, I decided this was a visit from Hermes Mercury. You remember, um, he's often represented as a trinity. He was the god who uh, guided souls to the underworld, acted as a messenger or herald between gods and mortals. He's the god of liminality. He is the god of betwixt and between, the archetype of transition between different phases of life. And of course, in alchemy, he's also the elusive spirit concealed in matter. Um, the spirit of the unconscious or, or the spirit um, or the process by which matter and spirit are transformed into each other, which of course is very important in understanding illness and healing, which is a situation where spiritual factors affect the body. So for Jung, Mercury is a, a metaphor for the slippery quality of the unconscious, which we cannot grasp, or for the transformations involved in the individuation process. Um, well, I won't go on uh, any, any further about this figure, um, except to say that uh, it, I didn't know what it meant at the time, but just shortly after having this visionary experience, which was quite brief, lasted several seconds and then disappeared, I became extremely ill and nearly died. So looking back on it in retrospect, this figure turned out to be a herald of a journey into a period of suffering, into a liminal period, into the unknown with the possibility of death. Um, eventually, obviously, I recovered. Uh, uh, what was helpful to me uh, was the idea that the self knew that I was going to go into this transitional period, that it wasn't random, that there was some kind of intelligence or pattern behind the experience. I found that particularly helpful and comforting and meaningful, but I didn't know at the time what the figure meant. Now, um, I want to mention another fact, um, which is often not recognized in the Jungian literature here. Um, Jung, in several places, says that the self is the totality of consciousness. It includes both consciousness and the unconscious. And I think this is an important link between Jung and the non-dual spiritual traditions. And I'm thinking here of Taoism, Advaita Vedanta, some most schools of Buddhism, and Sufism and some Jewish and Christian mystics as well, um, who talk about the, the unitary nature of reality, what Jung refers to in using the medieval term, the unus mundus, the fact that reality at, at a deep level is undivided. There's no real difference between self and the world at that level. Now, from that point of view of the totality, which is a non-dual uh, point of view, as distinct from the ego self axis, where the ego and the self are two, in a way, two different things, and the one relates to the other. From a non dual point of view, if the self is a totality, then uh, the ego cannot be separate from the self. It's essentially a part of the self, it's an image within the self, or something like that. Then, during a numinous experience, the self will manifest some aspect of itself as it were unclouded by the ego. 
one has a sort of direct experience. It's an interesting irony that from a non-dual point of view, if there was a sage of the non-dual traditions here, he or she would say that from that point of view, there's no need to search for meaning in suffering because that would just be another egoic story. I won't elaborate that point anymore, um, except to, to point out that uh, also that the experiences of synchronicity, which are always very numinous, also point to this non-dual level of the unos mundos. So it's not an idea that we should take lightly, even though it's not stressed much in the Jungian literature, which tends to prefer the notion of the ego self-axis, which is rather dualistic. But synchronistically, of course, meaningfully links the inner world, the outer world, physical events and the psyche, showing that they're really a unity. There are not two worlds, there's only one reality. And a synchronistic event is a numinous reminder of that fact. The synchronistic events always give us the impression that something has happened which cannot be attributed to chance. It's the result of a larger background process, as if the event was meant to be. And that's why it's often very numinous. It's as if fate or destiny is playing a role. The personalistic psychologists, by the way, are catching up with you a little bit in this area. They're now talking about what they call turning points, moments in time where a sudden life-changing event occurs, which, which is beyond the, individual, the individual's control. And of course, this can be positive or negative. But these kind of events make us feel that life is full of meaning, that it was our destiny for this to happen. And this event can become part of our life narrative, part of a personal myth that can give life meaning. Now, the body is another very important source of numinous experience that can be very meaningful. Uh, a woman told me of an experience while she's spinning in a Sufi ritual. This is her report. As I turn round and round for what seemed like a glorious ecstatic eternity, she's obviously going into an altered state here, I experienced myself as a hollow tube connecting earth and spirit. The earth energy rose through my feet and spirit light came down from above. I became a conduit through which the two energies could unite. I found new purpose in my humanness as a transformer of divine energy into the physical plane. I felt it even though I could not find a way to describe the numinosity of the experience either then or now. So here the body is acting as a kind of antenna for these transpersonal energies to move through it. Why the body? Well, it may be that, you know, that the particular channel through which the numinosum appears um, depends on, is a function of one's uh, typology, because we know that the unconscious that the, the unconscious manifests itself more readily through the fourth function in this particular woman. The fourth function was introverted sensation, so perhaps it's not surprising that it would appear to her through the body. Um, suffering makes people who have always been very rational, very intellectual, um, much more open to the realm of transpersonal experience. This can be an orthodox manifestation of the numinous, or it could be unique, but in any case, it's always recognizable by its emotional quality. And contact with this dimension always gives an automatic sense of meaning. And it does so because we feel the larger intelligence in the background, we feel part of a whole, we feel there's a superordinate order in the background and that life has a pattern to it. Now, if you're an atheistic psychotherapist, the search for meaning um, in these kind of ways, either in terms of a traditional religion or in terms of numinous experience and so on, th this kind of uh, event may appear to be completely defensive. Um, and if you're a psychotherapist working with a, an atheistic individual, one simply has to be tactful and respectful uh, working with that person. That there's no way to prove that the meaning which is found in a, in, in a situation of suffering is really given by a transpersonal source, or whether the individual somehow makes it up as a way of coping. This is partly a matter of one's own personal metaphysical commitments. Certainly there are lots of people still today who find meaning in traditional religion, 
and they find guidance about how to find meaningful in a traditional religion. And these can uh, uh, improve people's well-being. And as Jung says, religions can act as psychotherapeutic containers. Religious beliefs tend to reduce anxiety when they say, for example, your suffering is the will of God or it's your karma and so on. Um, and it's certainly well established in the research now that high levels of religious involvement and practice will, will protect against depression and will enhance the ability to, to deal with difficult things like uh, terminal illness and chronic pain and so on. It, it does feel helpful to believe that a larger power is controlling the situation. Um, and sometimes people who don't consider themselves to be religious in any formal sense will still admit that what's happening to them seems to be the result of fate. And whether or not you will acknowledge it, if you believe in fate, you are acknowledging that there is some kind of transpersonal background to your life. So overall, there seems to be widespread agreement that finding meaning in suffering is better than allowing suffering to embitter one's life. But it's not always clear how this meaning can be found. You may have to either find or construct a story about the situation to find meaning. And I say find or construct because there's a discussion in the literature about whether the meaning of a situation that's difficult is inherent in the meaning, as if the meaning is given by the archetype or by a, by a background spiritual process, in which case we have to discover it or whether meaning is created as a story within the within the person or within the therapeutic couple. One shouldn't be too rigid about this dichotomy. They're, they're both a bit problematic if you carry them to extremes. If you believe that meaning exists outside the individual as a kind of essence given by a divinity, then the problem is you could there's only one true meaning and it may be hard to find. And that leads to a kind of inflexible attitude. If you think that meaning resides only in human beings, then different people can attribute different meanings to the same event. And then we're all creating our own reality. There are no absolute standards. Morality is relative and so on. And that produces its own problems. Again, if you're an atheist, there's no need to invoke a transpersonal level to your suffering. You can think of it simply as the tragic side of life, bad luck, chance, and so on. But still you can construct or co-construct with the therapist a satisfying story. Um, and then you may be projecting meaning into the situation, but either way you decide on a narrative that fits with the dynamics of the individual's personality. And many contemporary psychotherapists believe that our understanding of a person's life is no more than a narrative creation. It's a function of the therapeutic relationship. So the meaning that we derive from the narrative is relative and not absolutely true. It's provisional and it can be revised. And some people say this is just a story we develop to smooth out the ambiguities of our lives and achieve coherence. But still, these stories can be extremely helpful. And then the role of the therapist is to assist in the working out of the story, which will develop some meaning that will be of help to the person. But the important thing is not to do so in a way that imposes meaning derived from the therapist's theoretical orientation. Um, because there are always multiple meanings in human behavior. And of course, different theoretical orientations will produce different stories. Um, if you believe that meaning is objectively given, for example, in a synchronistic event by a, some kind of the self or a spiritual intelligence operating in the background, um, then you have to discover the meaning. And this is an attitude that many Jungians believe when they say that the personality has a telos a purpose or a goal which it's trying to attain, then the suffering can be seen as a kind of a course correction. It's pointing us in a particular direction that otherwise we might not go. Um, then the meaning of the suffering is really connected with its purpose for the future. And then the role of the psychotherapist is, is to assist in the discovery of what the suffering might be pointing to. And one can ask the person, where is this situation taking you? that otherwise you might not go. That would be um, what Jung would call the prospective approach to it. Um, 
if you are skeptical about teleological theories, as some people are, then you will see them as defensive. You will see them only as an attempt to make, say, make sense of randomness or just increase the individual sense of closure or uh, sense of mastery and so on. Then that's a matter of judgment, really, and a matter of personal opinion. What I can assure you is that suffering will help you get to know you yourself in a way that very few other processes can. This is a very painful process, especially for older people, because older people, when they look back at their life in what's often called a life review, um, will often find discrepancies between the fantasies they had about the way they wanted their life to unfold and the way it actually unfolded. So this life review can take a great deal of courage. It means taking a hard look at illusions, it means grieving disappointments, goals that were not met, and so on, and will never be met. But by and large, telling these kind of stories to another person is, a, is an important mode of connection to other people. The, 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 the discovery of meaning then can be incorporated into the overall story of one's life. One's suffering can be incorporated into the overall story of one's life, what's sometimes called one's narrative identity. And then the suffering seems to make sense and have some value and provide opportunity for development. Um, and um, I want to give another example of how suffering can make one see the world in a different way. And I'm using the example given by Kay Jamieson, the psychiatrist, um, who has published about a book about her mental illness. And she says she had to severe bipolar disorder. In the book, she said, I would choose to have my illness, quote, because I honestly believe that as a result of it, I have felt more things more deeply, had more experiences more intensely, loved more and been loved. I have been aware of finding new corners in my mind and heart, all this because of the illness. So she sounds in the book as if her illness was crucial to the development of her sense of self, but it did produce a great deal of suffering. So suffering will reveal character structure and it will have important developmental consequences. And the way I suggest that we start a conversation with a meaning, with a person in psychotherapy about this issue of meaning is to ask the person, what is sustaining you through this difficult period? Is it another person? Is it a, an occupation, an evocation and so on? Or I might ask, what is giving you hope and comfort? Or I might ask, what are you grateful about at the moment? Is there some way in which, even though you're suffering, your life still matters? Do you have a sense of purpose in life? Do you know what your life is really all about? If the person has, uh, if the patient has a spiritual orientation, then the suffering can be seen as an invitation from the transpersonal dimension to initiate this kind of inquiry. If you're working with an atheist, um, especially somebody with an existential orientation, you can still assist the person in finding a personal sense of meaning. It simply is meaning without any transpersonal background. It's still a valuable process. One warning is that there are times when it's presumptuous to try to find meaning in, in another person's suffering. and it, can sometimes, if you do this prematurely, it can feel to the sufferer as if the therapist does not really understand the intensity of what the individual is going through. And sometimes the therapist can sound simplistic or patronizing. So one has to be very careful and tactful about doing this. Um, very often, uh, if one does this prematurely, it feels as if the therapist is just trying to avoid the issue. So the best you can do sometimes is create the conditions in which meaning might be found. And you have to be humble and open and receptive for that to happen. Certainly not by knowing in advance what meaning will emerge. And certainly not by technical or manualized approaches, which are ego-driven, harmful. They, they, they mean that you have the patient has to submit to the therapist's agenda, which is a disaster. It's often what happened to the person in childhood. And it won't allow for the emergence of something unexpected or creative from the unconscious. You have to wait for the meaning 
of the situation to emerge organically, I think. And often the meaning comes out of our imagination. It doesn't come out of logical thought. The meaning of an experience may not emerge cognitively or verbally. It may come as a kind of a fantasy image. Um, the imagination, of course, is the source of our creativity, and it will allow us to interpret situations in unexpected ways, and then it can free us from being trapped in a situation. So, for example, in Western thought, there's a long-standing association between melancholia and inspiration and the imagination. So melancholia can be very paralyzing, but it can also occasionally stimulate the imagination and produce creative insights. It's as if one needs the, the forced introversion and the solitude and so on that melancholia produces to access these deep truths about oneself. So melancholia can stimulate the imagination and the imagination can be a way of working with melancholia, which is why creativity, creativity is a resource for melancholic artists and writers and why Jung suggested that we cast the mood into an image and dialogue with it. Um, so um, another approach uh, to suffering is to change our appraisal of the situation. Um, in other words, change the, um, some of our um, uh, some of the way we look at life, um, given the situation. Um, if we can't reconcile the event with the way we've looked at the world so far, we may have to change our entire philosophy of life to accommodate what's happened. We may have to revise our goals, values, and belief systems if the situation is overwhelming and cannot be assimilated. The problem is that um, the shadow side of this is that people can develop defensive optimism. They can develop denial. They can develop false hope, rationalizations, or self-deceptive illusions. Uh, you can find meaning in suffering in a pathological manner. There are psychotic people who find delusional meaning, and they use that delusional meaning to shore up a fragile, fragmenting sense of self. But of course, the delusion has no relationship to reality. Um, there are a few other cautions. Uh, I've mentioned that it's important not to superimpose a theoretical or cognitive framework onto serious pain or distress. I think there are also situations like imprisonment in a concentration camp or a nuclear blast, a tsunami, something like that, which many people would say are completely meaningless. It's impossible to find meaning in a situation like that. Although, of course, some people say that, like Viktor Frankl would say, even in a situation like that, you can find meaning. Some people would say that's only a rationalization. Then there are situations where an event causes suffering at the time that it occurs. One can't find any meaning, but retrospectively, looking back on it some years later, one can see its meaning and it's important to why it was necessary at the time. The problem, of course, is that these kind of discoveries require interpretation, and interpretation always has biases. Um, we all we all have theoretical biases given our school of thought, and we don't want to color the, the the person's situation too much, the meaning of the situation with the therapist's subjectivity, or the the therapist's theoretical orientation. Um, I want to mention another aspect of the negative discovery of meaning, um, and I'm going to use an example that Chris Hedges talks about in his. Uh, but war is a force that gives us meaning. He points out that war can give purpose and meaning and a reason for living. And that um, compared to the soldiers experiencing combat, the rest of the soldier's life might feel as if it's rather shallow because there's a tremendous sense of aliveness in combat, comradeship in combat. The difficulty is that even when war is intensely meaningful, there are combat veterans who were haunted by the realization that they found meaning in killing. They return to ordinary civilian life. They find it quite difficult because it's not as meaningful as war, even though they're suffering from guilt and shame, and perhaps PTSD and so on. Um, so this is a, it's very much a, a, a mixed blessing because combat can produce increase in self-awareness. 
and a change in the veteran's attitude to life. But it can have this negative aspect as well. I should mention that for some people, war is meaningful because if that's if if the particular archetypal dominant in the individual soul is the path of the archetypal warrior, that is a valid spiritual path. That archetype uh, depicts a person who's willing to die for an important cause. He, he might die for his family, his country, his version of goodness and the fight against evil and so on. It's an exercise in spiritual self-effacement. He has to submerge his individuality. He has to face death. He has to be part of a larger whole. So this is a valid spiritual path for certain people. And that's why most of the world's religious traditions will recognize the path of the holy warrior, the samurai, the knights of the round table, the martial arts tradition of the East, which were used to develop spiritual qualities. And of course, the biblical Yahweh, Mars, Jupiter, Hercules, Mithra, and the gods of many religious traditions are often evoked, invoked in wartime. In a, uh, you know, Athena supported the Greeks, Hera supported, supported the Trojans. The Crusaders believed they were fighting the enemies of Christ. And the tradition continued when the angel of Mons appeared to allied troops in 1914. So even in these desperate situations, meaning can be found. Well, many thanks for your attention. Well, the, the first part of your question about um, the, the uh, really is the, the question about the psychological roots of cruelty. Um, which is an enormous question, uh, and there's a, a vigorous debate about this. The, the ancient idea is that people are cruel to others to exact revenge for the way that they were, themselves were treated when they were children. Um, Alice Miller writes about that, but it's a very old idea. Um, um, that they were, these are pe people who people are able to treat others with cruelty if they were treated in a cruel way as children. Um, there are people who abuse their children as a, as a way of dealing with the abuse that they suffered in their own childhood. They stabilize their narcissistic disequilibrium by hitting their children. And then cruelty is a kind of pathological product of accumulated rage. It's a form of revenge. Sometimes the abuser is unconsciously identifying with the people who abused him, and then the child who is being abused, for example, or the person who's being abused will represent a split off infantile level of himself. Most aggressive criminals suffered childhood abuse. I think probably they all did. Um, in an attempt to master the situation, uh, many victims of childhood abuse unconsciously will repeat the experience of being a victim of cruelty in a repetition compulsion. Of course, other people who are abused in childhood go into helping professions. They become therapists or social workers and so on, probably because they identified with somebody at the time who was kind to them at the time of the abuse. I should quickly add here that some people object to these kind of explanations of cruelty and torture, but the standard warning is that to understand evil, cruel behavior is certainly not to condone it. Of course. Um, there, there are many factors at work in the transformation of ordinary people into the, into the perpetrators of uh, extreme cruelty. There are uh, the social psychologists who reject the claim that only psychologically abnormal people commit cruel crimes. Um, ordinary people can pr commit genocide and mass killings, as we saw in Nazi Germany and Rwanda and so on. Um, although genocide requires not just an ideology um, or an ethnic prejudice, it also requires organization and training and leadership and so on. And there are many people who can't resist these kind of collective social pressures. Individual judgment is submerged by being part of a very large group especially if you have a charismatic leader like Hitler. And then people lose their individual identity and they regress and they're swept away 
by the emotions and the behavior of the, the large group, by the mass. And they behave in a way that they wouldn't behave as individuals. Um, the sense of being part of a huge group produces feelings of strength and security and so on. Um, and it reduces personal responsibility. Um, there's a great deal of literature on the, the situational and social factors that motivate genocide. These are factors like devaluation of particular ethnic or political groups with a despotic leadership, as we see in Syria, a destructive ideology with a, with a, with a simplistic one-dimensional view of history, that's what we saw in Nazi Germany, uncritical respect for authority, we saw that in Nazi Germany, in Nazi Germany a monolithic society, um, and the passivity of bystanders. Um, and when the bystanders, bystanders are passive, the perpetrators feel that the bystanders support them. Um, and even if the bystanders are not indifferent to people being persecuted, they do feel powerless in the, in, in the presence of a dictatorship with armed soldiers. And then, of course, you have um, psychological factors like idealization of a dangerous leader. That happened with Hitler in the early part of the war. Um, you have the power of group identity, which dilutes personal responsibility. You have thoughtless nationalism, the distortion of historical truth. You have religious prejudices, which is authoritarian leaders will manipulate, of course. And uh, dehumanizing propaganda. It's actually quite difficult to kill or torture another human being. But if you have enough dehumanizing propaganda, which is what the Nazis did to the Jews in the Second World War, then that makes people feel that the persecuted group is less than human. And during the Rwandan genocide, genocide this happened, the Hutus referred to the Tutsis as cockroaches. And of course, during the Holocaust, the Nazis referred to the Jews as rats, and they, they believed they had a moral, a moral duty to exterminate them. Um, but it's very important to note that there, there is an important counter-argument to this emphasis on social and situational pressures. Um, um, in the Nazi genocide, uh, Goldhagen pointed out that many of the perpetrators were responsible for their actions. They carried them out intentionally and knowingly and without coercion, although that book of Goldhagen produced considerable controversy. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, well, I, I could say more about this, but perhaps that's enough for the time being. I, I was going to evoke the uh, Zimbardo um, prison experiment and uh, and um, the Milgram's revelation uh, that the insistence of an authority will allow all ordinary people to produce cruel acts. And there are other experiments. There's the Dali Good Samaritan experiment and so on. Um, but I think it would take too long to, to go into all of that. Yes. Uh, oh, I think the question is about whether one can find one's own story in, in the mythic history of humanity, that one can locate one's own story in the larger stories of humanity in a myth or fairy tale. And that's one of the classical Jungian approaches, and I certainly think it can be helpful. The difficulty is that one can't always find the correct story. One, one can't always find a mythic or folkloric story which corresponds to one's own situation. But I think if you can, it's certainly very helpful. But sometimes you have to come up with a story of your own. <laughs>
Well, not all numinous experience or mystical experience involves a loss of self. There are certainly what are called unitive experiences where the, the person feels uh, a total loss of any individual sense of ego or meanness, where one is sort of the whole world and then one doesn't exist as an individual. That's described in all the mystical traditions and people still have those kinds of unitive experiences. But there are other numinous experiences in which one has contact with the numinous and retains a certain sense of personal identity at the same time, as if there's an, a me who knows that he is experiencing that, capital T, that. And then one doesn't lose one's sense of identity completely. And there's a spectrum in between. Now, uh, I think the questioner might be asking whether if one is wounded more deeply, if one is more likely to lose one's sense of self completely. Um, and um, I think um, one way I could answer that is that people with a very fragile sense of self, small itself, bought people with so-called borderline personality disorders, as Don Calshed and others point out, have a, have a, have a much thinner um, repression barrier than uh, healthier people. The barrier, the veil between the unconscious and consciousness is much thinner and material from the deep unconscious or the transpersonal unconscious is more likely to erupt into consciousness so that the personal self is constantly being threatened by material from the unconscious. So I think they are perhaps more likely to experience a disruption of the ordinary sense of self than people with a, with a, a healthy sense of self to begin with, with a a stronger ego if you like but it's important to remember the old saying that the the, um, the psychotic person drowns in the same waters that the mystic swims in uh, it's just that but then there are healthy mystics and psychotic mystics as well so there's a, a, a sort of a wide spectrum here Well, I think that one simply has to keep talking about the event, going over it and over it. The only other ways I know of doing it would be through hypnosis, through the recall of the event through hypnosis. Um, I don't know any other way of doing it. I, I'm not particularly keen on, the, on doing it through hypnosis. I, the only way I know is to keep talking about the event, circling around it. Uh, watching the dreams, of course, um, and then what I find is that fragments come back over time. But if they, if the fragments don't come back, perhaps that's a necessary defense. Perhaps the person isn't able to cope with some of the material that doesn't come back. I like your comments on war veterans and PTSD. I was in the military for 12 years myself, and I've seen a, a lot of combat veterans and, and defining it as search for meaning of nothing's as meaningful as combat. That's a, it's a powerful you know, way of looking at it. And that's, that was a new you know, piece. I didn't you know, thought of that. It's that archetypal dominant in, in the individual soul, of course, it's not for everybody. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. The combat soul change, the, the folks I know that have been through combat, it's just a, a very much a soul changing experience. Um, so we I go have on. a question. Go ahead, Len. Uh -huh. Lionel, I, I'd like to just return to some of the remarks you were making about synchronous events. It, it caused me to re reflect on the etymologic root of the word synchronous and thinking of it as something occurring together in time. And I wondered if part of what you were alluding to and perhaps you could comment on is that experience we've had of a synchronous event when it's as if two worlds are in collision in a moment in time be it our interior world and our exterior life, our extant life, or the numinous and the material. Is that sort of in keeping with what what you were um, speaking of? Yes, absolutely. It's like, it's, it's like a glimpse into the transpersonal background. So it is like a meeting of the two worlds. And we've got to be careful not saying that the one causes the other, because we're not supposed to talk about synchronistic causes. No, I think that's what often makes it so ineffable, is that it, it, the most you can say of it is that they 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 were coexistent in a moment. 
it's a glimpse into the Unus Mundus, and it's one of the places where Jung works with the, the non-dual spiritual traditions. He, he does that in other places as well, where he talks about the, uh, the self as the totality of consciousness, in which case, if the self is the totality, the ego is only uh, it's an image within the self, the really only is the self. This is consonant with non-dual traditions like Yahweh's and Society of the and so on. Uh, usually when we talk about the ego self-axis, we're talking about um, a rather dualistic approach. But there are places where Jung moves into a non-dual. And in that notion of the self, it would be more akin to a container that is large and expansive enough to, to hold both worlds concurrently. Well, it's the totality yeah. of everything. It is. The, um, we can't really say much more about it. Lionel, it's uh, Christina speaking uh, in Toronto. I, I wanted to thank you for your great presentation. Um, what I was mindful of was the challenge about trying to describe an experiential in terms of suffering um, that that often we we hold that space for somebody to actually connect to something um, experiential which is I think ultimately what um, psychotherapy and what the spiritual journey is about and and holding that space for the suffering um, and trying to facilitate uh, a container within which um, that experience uh, happens and so I was mindful of when um, when Jung talks about you know uh, it you know the healing process happens in um, with God willing you know it's mm -hmm. it's kind of like you know God creates the grace in terms of what of what happens and I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on that well, uh, I think the notion of the container is, is very important um, because um, um, there are times in therapy where all one can do is be a witness uh, and be a presence because the person's suffering is, cannot be fixed. And um, the, the witnessing is extremely powerful. Human beings have a need to have their suffering witnessed. And that's one of the important functions of psychotherapy. Um, it helps if the therapist believes that there's a transpersonal process going on. But it, it's not necessarily something you have to discuss with the patient. It can be a personal myth which helps the therapist stay in the room and be fully present. But it's quite difficult to be fully present in, in, in the presence of somebody who's suffering intensely. Um, I'm not sure if that's really addressing your question. Um, well, well, yeah. Well, I think I think it is because um, uh, you know I'm very mindful in in Canada we are um, just we're just approaching regulation in terms of psychotherapy, and um, you know often when as Jungians we are uh, presenting a spiritual or a, a, a kind of a mythical approach to to the journey mm -hmm. that uh, you know the collective is um, you know collective is is reinforcing um, cognitive behavioral therapy that's what's being funded you know all of those things and so um, to hold that space of that there is a deeper meaning um, happening here I think I think is very helpful and it's kind of the silent witnessing and I think that was my other comment um, that I wanted to make was that um, you know how do you find um, uh, working in this particular way in in the face of California which I understand is a uh, uh, you know a fairly regulated state um, and and lots of people are not necessarily you know looking at psychotherapy from this kind of spiritual perspective yeah that's true and, and most people here practice with a cognitive behavioral orientation 
but specifically we teach that psychotherapy. I, I teach in the Dutch psychotherapy program. Uh, and we, we teach a largely Jungian and uh, somewhat modern psychoanalytic approach. And um, we think it's a superior approach, obviously. Um, uh, we, we, I mean, I, you know, it's clear to me that just removing symptoms is, is rather like uh, ripping out the, um, the warning light on your car dashboard. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't solve the problem. Mm. But it's, it's, it's a function of insurance companies and third party payers. And that's what we're dealing with. Um, and you have to work privately. Yeah, well, it is a particular challenge. Um. I, I always believe that, you know, the people who need to find us will find us. Yes, that's true. Yeah. I just put a piece on um, YouTube where I discuss the difference between deaf psychotherapy and cognitive therapy. Oh, okay, right. And I've gone into it in some detail and, and, and discussed this question of evidence because they're all mm. talking about evidence-based therapy. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to make the point that there are lots of different kinds of evidence besides quantitative methods and the unconscious of course is much too slippery for quantity. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and anyway, so it's all it's all in this video. That's great, thank you. Final if there's if I could ask yet another question. It, it pertains to the comments you were making in your discussion of narrative identity. Yeah. And I, I was noting the fact that it almost seemed as though you were describing two distinct aspects, both of which are vital and I, I suppose um, profoundly important if you can encompass them. But one was just the value of, I think you referred to, of recounting your story. And, and it struck me as though the, the mere fact that as therapists, as analysts, we validate a person's narrative it has great profound importance at times in and of itself. But the other aspect seemed almost more like the equivalent of functioning in concert with, with a client as, a, as an editor or an interpreter of their story in order to embed it in me with some meaning. And, and while I understood your emphasis on not trying to impose our bias, I, I assumed you meant that to be kind of a goal and an aspiration, often yeah. one that we can comfort ourselves to know we'll miss the mark. but. Um, that's really kind of the the um, intention, but you're not proposing that that's actually something that really can be accomplished in a dyadic relationship, are you? To be completely unbiased. Objective, objective meaning? Or, yeah, or to be completely unbiased in our influence. Oh, um, oh. These are people we come to care about and yeah, become involved with. Yeah, um, no, that's a counselor's question. <laughs> <laughs> So, so it is really intended to be sort of a goal and objective to keep an unbiased um, frame, right? Yes, that's right. We come to a sort of mutual understanding that we both agree on. I see. And yet again, part of that second aspect is really to um, invite and provide a, a means by which the person can embed that story of theirs with yeah. some meaning. Give them a framework and make sense of it. The witness function of psychotherapy is very, very important. On the, on the part of both yeah. parties in that. The yeah. business of telling one story to, to a, a really receptive witness is extremely helpful. If the witness is fully present. It's not so easy to do, but it's very helpful if you can do it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Because the, the problem is that there are forms of suffering that we can't do anything about. And the only thing one can do is somehow radically accept it. It's somehow necessary. Uh, and that's what we're really asking a great deal. Well, and you know, it, it, it begs the obvious um, notion of what it truly means to be compassionate, to be with that suffering and perhaps not feel compelled to do something about it only, but to, to be with it. Well, I want to thank everybody today. I know it was a, a difficult evening, but a uh, marvelous one as well. We had some, some real you know, jewels and then some real suffering here too. Uh, I want to thank you, Lionel. Uh, you're so good at this material and I love the, the work that you've done.
Um, any last thought before we close? Anything you want to say before we say goodbye to folks? No, I'm, uh, you know, I hope it was helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm convinced it is very much. And thank you, Len and, and Christina. That was Christina Becker, you know, by the way, who is you know, on uh, the speaker you know, phone for a little bit as well. And she's a, a Jungian analyst you know, from Toronto area and is a published author as well. And we hope to entice her to come on for a seminar later on as well. So with no further ado, we'll say good night you know, for today. We'll try to get something you know, published out there for people to uh, hear more from Lionel. We really appreciate that. So thank you again and, and good night. Good night.